So a very warm welcome to you all to Canal Side Benefits for this special service in which we're celebrating ministry. We're celebrating the wonderful long late minister, ministry as a lame, licensed lay minister of Catherine Moore, who is now retired but is becoming uh, LLM Emeritus. And it's wonderful to welcome Catherine and Kenneth here today. Uh, and Kenneth, we know that Catherine's ministry has, has, has been because you've worked as a team and your ministry and support is deeply appreciated too. It's a day of celebration all round because later in the day some of us will be going to Salisbury Cathedral to welcome Bishop Stephen as he becomes Bishop of Salisbury or rather begins his ministry as Bishop of Salisbury. So it's wonderful today to celebrate both faithful ministry coming to an end of a particular season though you do in your wise pastoral way continue to minister informally and to welcome Bishop Stephen as we begin an exciting new chapter of our diocesan life. And Archdeacon Sue, because of a pandemic, it's rather a long time since we've been able to welcome you here, but it's lovely to have you here to preach and preside today. You are very welcome, whether you're here in person or watching online at home. The Lord be with you all. And also with you. And we're now going to stand to sing our first hymn, number 19, All My Hope on God is Found.
let's have a moment of quiet, stilling ourselves before we join together in the prayer of preparation. And so we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us pause and call to mind, ready to confess our sins. And so we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, for our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We stand for the glory. standing and join together in saying the creed. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ your Son. Amen. Please sit for our first reading. reading is taken from Galatians, 
chapter 3, verse 23. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under the garden of the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew, Gentile, slave or free, male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tony. We're now going to stand to sing again. As the deer pants for the water, number 45 of you using the books. <laughs> Desire 
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. So they arrived in the region of the Gerasenes, across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down in front of him. Then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. This spirit had often taken control of the man, even when he was placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby and the demons begged him to let them enter into the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the entire herd plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. <clears throat> a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. Then those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had been healed, and all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone, for a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him home, saying, No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all through the town, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, God. May the words that I speak and all of our thoughts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Amen. Amen. Our experiences of visitors can vary widely. We can be delighted and excited to welcome long-lost friends into our homes. Or we can dread the dock at the door by military personnel or police officers, which heralds the death of a loved one. But what if Jesus came to visit? What would you do? How would you feel? Would you be excited and honoured, perhaps making preparations as you would for a visit from royalty? Would you be comforted and uplifted by the possibility of a visit from one who seems so loving and kind? Would you be anxious and uneasy, maybe hurrying to do some cleaning and tidying up? <laughs> would you prepare a special meal Perhaps go out and buy a new outfit if you had time. What would you do if Jesus came to visit you? In our visit from Luke's Gospel, Jesus pays a visit to the country of the Gerasenes, a Gentile region across the Sea of Galilee. He comes, as he always does in Luke's Gospel, with the authority and power of God's invading reign. When Jesus comes to visit, it is no longer business as usual. When Jesus is present, people 
and conditions are challenged, upset and transformed. His visit to the Gerasenes is quite an impact. Almost before he can get off the boat, Jesus is met by a man described as having demons. The man is stark naked. He appears to be quite crazy. He comes at Jesus from his home in the graveyard. He is shouting at Jesus to leave him alone, not to torment him. As the story unfolds, we learn that it is not really the man who is speaking to Jesus, but the demons who are bargaining with Jesus. In a dramatic scene, Jesus sends the demons to their destruction and restores the man to health and wholeness. Here is the transforming power of God at work. The dramatic change in this troubled man's life is the kind of transformation sung about by you too. Don't know how many of you know you too, but my husband is a big fan, so I know quite a lot about them. You too sing a song called When Love Comes to Town. The verses tell the story of a life marked by betrayal and confusion, the life of someone who was lost. The life changed when it was confronted by robust love. I did what I did before love came to town repeats the chorus. But love did come to town and the singer's life was changed. I can imagine the healed man in the gospel story might well have sung a song just like this. I did what I did before love came to town. And then love came and everything changed. It's interesting to look at the reactions of different people to this visit of Jesus. The demons realise immediately they're in the presence of a power greater than their own. They represent the forces of evil and oppression that are active in our lives and in the world. And these forces, these dark forces, always tremble when they come before the dynamic presence of God. The reaction of the Gerasenes, the local people, to the healing of their neighbour is quite striking. You might think that they would be happy for the man who has caused them so much trouble and is now sane and whole. You might think they would throw a party to celebrate the miracle of salvation, or they'd hurry to bring their friends to Jesus, anyone they knew who needed healing of any kind. But no, there is no party, there is no celebration. Luke reports that the Gerasenes, the local people, are seized with a great fear. They're in a state of panic. They're scared, and so they ask Jesus to leave their community. That's very sad, and it seems like an odd response to those of us who don't think of Jesus as frightening. Why are they scared? Maybe they're fearful that if Jesus stays around, they won't be able to make a living. After all, he's just sent a large part of the local economy to destruction in the lake. They relied on those pigs. That was their economy. The unsettling power of Jesus extends to purses and economic systems. But the fear of these people may be about more than the possibility of no longer having a job. Think about it. If Jesus has power over the forces of the world that oppress and bind people, if Jesus can heal somebody like that long-suffering man in the story, destroying a pig farm in the process, what might he do next? What can he do? Who is safe from such a power? And what about if I don't want to see my life turned upside down, but I prefer to remain comfortable in the familiar way of life? There is a, a parable about a farmer who had a few animals he kept in a barn and the barn was rather old and drafty and very leaky. He was concerned for his animals' well-being, so the farmer decided to build a nice new barn for them. And he built a fine barn and tore down the old one and was comforted to know that his animals were now safe and dry in the new barn. One day, a violent storm came through the area and the farmer decided he'd better check on his animals in the barn. 
He was shocked to discover that the barn door had been left unlatched and all of the animals had left the new barn. They were huddled together beneath the storm within the foundations of the old familiar barn. It is so much easier for all of us to hold on to what we know than to face the new. And when Jesus comes to visit, he brings the possibility of new beginnings, transformation and healing. But that means the end of other beginnings and old ways of living. For the Gerasenes, the local people, it was just too much of a risk. And so they asked Jesus to leave them alone. The fear of the new is not unknown to us. We see it in churches and in individuals who cling to old patterns of living. And if Jesus comes to visit, we might just ask him to leave, like the Gerasenes, afraid of what he might do to our familiar ways. When we, one way we often get Jesus to leave is by taming him by turning him into someone who is kind and gentle, <coughs> someone who never gets too upset, someone who is never a threat to anyone. Dorothy Alceus has written about this domestication of Jesus, and she writes this, The people who hanged Christ never accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up the shadowing personality, and surround him with an atmosphere of tedium. We have very efficiently paired the claws of the Lion of Judea, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for pale curates and pious old ladies. Such a domesticated Jesus leaves us unhealed and protects us from the awesome power of God. <coughs> There is one other reaction to Jesus' visit in the story, and of course that is the man who was healed. This powerful Jesus has given him back his life. From a naked, howling, tormented man who lived in the graveyard, he has been changed into one who sits at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Astonishing. It really is astonishing. And that healed man is so grateful that he pleased to be allowed to go with Jesus back to Galilee. But Jesus says, no, it's up to you to be an apostle in your hometown, bursting with good news of what God has done for you. If fear is our response to the power of Jesus and to the possibility of new life, I imagine this man would say to us, I understand your fear, but don't be too quick to send Jesus away. I wouldn't go back to who I was before Jesus came, not for anything. Trust Jesus to make the best of your life. You never know when or where Jesus is going to turn up. He just might come to visit me or you today or tomorrow or next week with an offer of healing and new life and with the power to make it happen. I encourage you to be open to what Jesus might do in you and in us together. You never know what might happen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <coughs> Thank you, Sue, because that speaks so much into work that we're doing on looking at our vision and our priorities going forward at the moment, where we're trying to celebrate what we do that actually does enable love to come to God's love to come to town here in our villages, but where we're challenging ourselves to look at what we might do that would be new, that might be different, albeit sometimes a bit scary. So thank you. Let's stand to declare our faith by joining in the creed together. <coughs>
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified at Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit or kneel to pray. Our response today is, Gracious Father, give us compassion, we pray. As on the screen. Let us bring to the God who loves us our prayers and concerns and thanksgiving for the church and the world. We give thanks today for the many people of this church who have served you in the past and for those who serve you in the present. We thank you particularly for Catherine, for her quiet faithful, compassionate ministry to this village community and to our church over so many years. Bless her as she relinquishes some of her responsibilities and may she and Kenneth know your continued presence in their life together. Gracious Father, give, give us, us compassion, compassion, we pray. We pray for your vision for the future of our benefits and we pray for Stephen, our new bishop, as he is enthroned this afternoon. Inspire him and us with your love. Fill us with wisdom and power. Gracious Father, give us compassion, we pray. God of wisdom, Teach all in authority, inspire those who lead, protect each nation from evil, and further each right decision. We lift to you your suffering world, where war, poverty or famine ruins lives. We pray for peace in Ukraine for blessing on all those who have left their country for new homes far away. <coughs> Gracious Father, give us, us compassion, we pray. God of tenderness, dwell in our homes through all the times of joy and all the heartaches and sadness, teaching us to show one another the love you show us. Gracious Father, give us compassion, we pray. God of wholeness, speak into the despair <clears throat> and loneliness of all who struggle with life and its troubles. Reassure, affirm and encourage them and alert us to ways we can help. 
We pray for all who suffer in body, mind or spirit, especially those on our prayer list or in our hearts today. We pray for your healing touch. Gracious Father, give us compassion, compassion, we pray. God of peace, be with the dying, and as you welcome those who have died and sent into the full life of your kingdom, we too remember them with thanks and love. God of compassion, take our hearts of stone <coughs> And give us healing hearts, so that we as the church may be more responsive to the needs and sorrows around us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand for the peace? When the risen Jesus appeared among his disciples, he said, My peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And I will also with you. you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. It's one chosen by Catherine, and it's number 565 of you using the books. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy 
at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, for he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing.
as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have, have mercy. mercy on us. Jesus, Jesus bearer of our, our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. Amen. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us, and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
Let us find the promised rest. Take away the love of sinning, Alpha and Omega B, and of faith as its beginning. Set our hearts at least. What a wonderful hymn to finish with. Do please sit down. <coughs> All our notices for the week are as usual in Canal Side News. Uh, if you don't receive it, there are some copies at the back of church. And if you're watching online, uh, do email Michael Gamble and we could send one out to you. But we're not quite at the end of the service. Catherine, can you come out here, please? And Marilyn, could you come out as well? <coughs> you probably didn't think we were going to let you get away entirely without, uh, without recognition of your wonderful, faithful service. Catherine, I've been here six years, and I know that's only a very small part of your ministry here. And in the time I've known you, I've been greatly appreciative of your deep prayerfulness, of your pastoral wisdom, your leadership of the prayer group, and your gentle, thoughtful way of leading services. So, in my time here, you, you've made an enormous difference. But I know that you've made a much longer difference here. And therefore, Marilyn, who's been here a lot longer than I have, is going to say a few words as well. Thank you, John. Yes, I've known Catherine almost, come September, 22 years. But my friends, I know in this congregation, there are many of you who have known Catherine much longer than I have. But here's the reflections of my 22 years, Catherine, of being with you. Well, my goodness, what could you say about a lady called Catherine? An awful lot, but I've been told to keep this quite brief. <laughs> There's a challenge for a start. But what can I say? He's just a flavour of some of the things that I have witnessed and so have many of you and you could add your own. Do tell me afterwards, please. As John has already said, co-ordinator of, co of the prayer group, my goodness, 
how Catherine values prayer. She is a prayerful woman. She's queen of rotor makings, believe me. Um, a food rotor organisation when we held an alpha um, evenings at Staverton School. Yes, Catherine. She used to say to me, what would you like this week, Marilyn? And I'd say, and she'd round up ladies, do, and they'd do the cooking. Thank you very much, ladies, who are still alive with us now. And Catherine would collect and deliver. Coordinator for Open Church, when it was decided that we were going to open the church every afternoon. So was Catherine there with her rota, making sure we all knew the ropes and what we needed to do because we were there to meet and greet and show hospitality. Holding the fort, my goodness, Catherine, how many vacancies have you held the fort through? I, have, I don't know the number, but I've certainly been here for three. And Catherine organised us all. Absolutely had us all right there. This is what we're doing. Who's doing what? Very good indeed, Catherine. Thank you. A school governor for Staverton School, where Catherine went in to listen to young people read. And I'm sure she was just a gentle person to be there. Being part of the marriage prep team. What fun we've had with those, Catherine. Being a prayer team member. Um, in church on after Sunday services when we used to have regular prayers offered for anybody who would wish after a Sunday service. A PCC member for more years than I think most of us could add up together. A service leader, an intercessor, a preacher. And I know you've blessed so many of us, Catherine, with your reflections. Thank you. And the numerous funerals Catherine has taken within this benefice and her pastoral care for those people who were bereaved has been exemplary. If anybody wants to know how a LLM should live out their ministry, look to Catherine Moore. Home communions. My goodness, Catherine has done so many of those. A good listener, very important, always having time for people, an encourager. When we decided that we were going to start Messy Church and open the book, Catherine said, I can't do such and such, but I will pray. Thank you, Catherine. That's one of the finest things you can do, my friend, because everything we do, surely in the name of Jesus, needs to be underpinned by prayer. And she's been warden of the readers of Bradford Deanery. Thank you for all those meetings, Catherine, and those words of encouragement. As always, the gentle prod at the end to keep up the good work. Personally, thank you, Catherine, for many things, but for the warm welcome you gave me and my family. It was tremendous. Thank you. And also for showing me the ropes of the vestry. My goodness, you need somebody to show you to how to open that safe, believe me. <laughs> there is a knack. <laughs> Often I would say, I'm sorry, Catherine, I don't think this thing's opened. And she said, well, my dear, this is the little knack you need for this bit. <laughs> and it worked. But everything, everything Catherine has undertaken his bone down with compassion, with love, with sincerity. What a blessing to have Catherine Moore in Canal Side Benefits. What a blessing. And she's done it with love and devotion. Devotion to the Lord she knows, loves and serves and will keep on serving. And I was, t I was just thoughtful, actually, when 
we pray together the collect. Because to me it spoke, Catherine, you have found true life in Jesus Christ. And you have led your life to the fullness of proclaiming his kingdom in word and action. Bless you. Thank you. And also, as we know, and I, I'm going to finish in a minute, <laughs> behind every good man, there's a good woman. Well, in this case, behind every good woman, there's a good man. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Kenneth, for loaning your wife to us for many, many, many hours, for your support of her, and for this benefit, for your support and love for this community too. Bless you and thank you. And finally, Catherine, this is not goodbye at all. No, not at all. This is just a new ministry opening up for you, where we know you will still be a blessing. You will still be a prayer warrior you will still be compassionate and full of love. You will still have that wonderful listening ear. May God grant you and Kenneth many happy more years together. Thank you. Thank you for a really wonderful talk. So let me sit down in just a moment, but uh, can those who are going to give the presentations come out? And may I reply for a moment? Oh, yes. Please do. Catherine, do you want. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not quite speechless, um, but very nearly. Sadly, the time has come to say I am not capable and therefore I must withdraw. But um, memory comes back very quickly of how I got here. Um, for some years I've been linked with congregational independent churches, a few of Methodist ones latterly. And it changed when having moved into Church Street, very single, um, I began to see people walking round the corner to church. And I began to feel this is ridiculous. I am dashing back into Trowbridge every evening, or a lot of evenings. I really want to perhaps link in and see what they're like round there. And how does Anglicanism work? And I had a few moments with Richard Hicks and explained he was a rector at this time. And he, in his wisdom, said, oh, well, use us as a caravan, another caravan, for three months and, and just see. Well, um, it was a lovely community here, they were so welcoming, etc. So I went back at the end of three months thinking, well, perhaps they'll let me help make the coffee or something. Richard, I would like to stay, please. I've worked my way out of other responsibilities in these independent churches anyway. Right, what about training as a reader? <laughs> I hadn't bargained for that. <laughs> and at the end of 95, that autumn, I was discovering what Salisbury was all about and what a joy it's all been ever since then. But thank you for being you because you have made the family that I didn't have in the same way until I, Kenneth and I, to my great surprise as well, got married. <laughs> <laughs> and more dilemmas out of that because he was so involved in a church in Cainsham, which I had grown to love visiting there occasionally. The Almighty sorted us out 
Praise be. Thank you. So to mark this special occasion, we have a particular certificate just for you from the diocese. Award of the title of Lay Minister Emeritus. There you go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Catherine and for her many years of wise and faithful licensed lay ministry in Canal Cypress. We thank you especially for her gifts of pastoral care and teaching and her leadership of the prayer group. We thank you too for Kenny's support to her and to us. As Catherine becomes licensed lay minister emeritus, we ask for your continued blessing on them both. May they always know how much they are loved by you and also by us. Amen. Thank you so much. You can sit down now. <laughs> There is tea or coffee after the service. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.